Well, on we go with the story of Neil Gow and his talented sons and their music. Um, the violin I'm going to use in this second video is again a Scottish violin. And here it is. This is made by an amateur. Um, there are certain signs of crudeness in the making which suggest that. And it's made of fruit wood, which was commonly used by amateur makers in Scotland because it was cheap and um, usable. It was quite good. Anyway, how do I know it's Scottish? Because there's nothing to tell me. There's no label, there's no signature. Um, it could be made almost anywhere. Well, I do know that it's Scottish, I'm quite sure of it, and that's because after I'd had the van for a while and it was in an unplayable uh, state, a poor condition, uh, a friend of mine, Tommy Wallace, went to the very great trouble of restoring it to playing order, and I'm glad he did because it plays very well. And when he restored it, he, took, he had to take off the top, the table as it's called, and that's what he saw. He took a photo of it. That's the back of the violin uh, and the inside and a funny black stain, don't know why that's there, but at the bottom you will see writing. I don't think you'll be able to read it, could be wrong, but there's writing at the bottom. And in an enlargement, this is what the writing says. Can you read that? J. Keith, February 1854, Kelso. So it was made by J. Keith in Kelso in, the, in that year. And it's rather touching, I think, that he didn't. He wanted the violin to stay anonymous for some reason, and so um, you can't tell. But at the same time, he was fond enough of it to put his name inside it in a place where nobody could see it. Anyway, um, the story of the Gao family continues, and it was of a healthy rural nature in the mid and later 18th century. The older children would help around the house, no doubt, and the land, keeping an eye on the cattle, uh, bringing the cows in, bringing the cow rather, in from milking, perhaps helping with the horses at the inn by the ford at Inver, bringing down peats from Burnham Hill. Daughter Margaret, the older daughter, would help in and around the house with the younger children, feeding the hens, gathering in the eggs, and many domestic tasks which had to be done. In the winter of the school, and helping with the spinning and the weaving, winding the yarn and the bobbins. In the evenings there would be music, make, music making, dancing in the barn, and they would listen to stories told round the fireside, old Scottish stories, legends, legends and things. Neil taught his children to play the fiddle, and William, John, Andrew and Nathaniel, who inherited his musicality, all had significant careers, careers with music. Indeed, Neil, who knew that his sons had great musical talent, intended that their lives should move away from Invert to the glittering capital of Scotland, Edinburgh, in its prime uh, at the, in, in the Enlightenment, where much greater opportunities were to be had, and it's very likely that they had left the family home by the 1770s. In his own turn, Neil's energies turned increasingly to playing and to composition, and he was very much in demand for both, not just locally, but a distance away, as I'll tell you later on in another video. So I'm going to play two tunes now. The first is Mrs Carmichael of Skirling. Who was she? I don't know much about her, but she married into an important family, that of the Earls of Hindford. Now their lands and their um, stately home were down in Peebleshire, a long way away from rural Perthshire. So presumably they visited the Duke of Athol from time to time, and that's why we have this tune, written by the Duke's music master. Here it is, a good tune, Mrs Carmichael of Skirling's.
The next tune I think is a very fine tune, Mrs. Mingus of Caldera. It's much more a slow air than, than um, a suspe. Um, who was Mrs. Mingus? Well, I don't really know much about her personally, but the family she married into was important. Um, as a matter of interest, they were responsible for introducing the larch tree into Scotland, and that was through the efforts of Colonel James Mingus of Caldera. Oh, I should say, by the way, the name is spelt Menzies, M-E-N-Z-I-E-S, and is often pronounced that way, first of Scotland, but in Scotland, Menzies is Mingus, Mrs Mingus of Caldera. Old Caldera had been pardoned for his part in the Jacobite Rising of 1715, and he'd stayed quietish following on from that. He'd travelled quite broadly, and from the Austrian Tyrol, he brought seeds and saplings of the larch tree to Blair Castle in 1737. Two of these original saplings, now obviously fully grown and very mature, rather splendid trees, can be seen outside Dunkeld Cathedral. Old Caldera was too old to take part actively in the 1745 Rising, Prince Charles Edward Stuart's Rising, but he wanted to show a gesture of support. So what he did was he sent a fine horse down south to the Prince's army as a gift. And the man who took it there um, was a man called McNaughton, a servant called McNaughton. But unfortunately, very unfortunately, he was intercepted by government troops at Carlisle and he was asked, because they were suspicious, what his business was and who had sent him. Well, he knew that if he mentioned uh, the Colonel's name, the Colonel would be in very serious trouble, having already been involved in this kind of, <clears throat> let's call it, misbehaviour in 1715, so he refused to say. But the government troops were very keen to find out who was behind all this, so they offered him his life if he told them the name. McNaughton was offended by this. He told them that only a villain would betray his master in that way. And I think very sadly, he did in fact die on the scaffold, never giving up the name of the old colonel. Now, there's no connection, I'm quite sure, between this tune and that sad story. And yet the tune is a quite a, a sad tune. So in a way, perhaps they go together fairly well. It's a fine tune, Mrs. Mingus of Caldera. With a large family and many domestic duties to attend to, Neil's music inevitably took central stage in his, in his life. There are many contemporary accounts of his playing, often from those who attended dinners, balls, Caleb's and the like, Cayley's and the like. And on the Duke's birthday, for example, the 30th of June 1783, we have an account from the Duchess who wrote to her sister Mary Graham as follows. It lasted from one o'clock when the guns were fired to four o'clock the following morning when daylight had taken the place of candlelight. A company of 56 were served dinner in a large tent on the lawn, while the work people were served theirs in the avenue before the house. Tea was then served for the ladies and gentlemen in the drawing room. During that time we were amused to see the workmen, etc., dance before the windows. After tea we returned to the tents and the company began dancing on the green. The whole town of Dunkeld and environs turned out to see the sport. 
When darkness fell, a bonfire was lit on the river, following which the people in Dunkeld set off fireworks, and several houses in the town were illuminated. After dinner there was singing, followed by dancing. Neil Gow and his brother played incessantly for upwards of 12 hours. Wow, upwards of 12 hours. They would be exhausted, uh, and all that for £5 per annum. But he was important. He provided the music, and at this kind of a celebration, the music was absolutely integral, very, very important. Um, no doubt Neil did enjoy the event too, as I imagine most people did. I am slightly amused by her sentence during that time we were amused with seeing the workmen etc. dance before the windows. There's something quite patronising about that, perhaps. Though perhaps we can take it literally that they enjoyed to see the pleasure that these people who would work very hard and with very, very little return for their labours, now just their keep really, and a little bit more, um, they might perhaps have enjoyed seeing them having good fun. I don't know. <clears throat> One thing that I am certain of is that while nobody nowadays, I would have thought, has heard of this particular Duchess of Athol in 1783, Neil Gow's name, one of these ordinary peasant folk, Neil Gow's name is known all over the world for the sort of music which we celebrate now. Anyway, two more tunes and then this video is at an end. And the first one is Farewell to Whiskey, Neil Gow's Farewell to Whiskey. This is a slow air, which became very popular in Neil's own time. Uh, and he wrote it as representative of a Highlander's sorrow on being deprived of his favourite beverage. Well, why would anyone deprive Neil Gow of his favourite beverage? In 1799, the barley crop failed. And the government, wisely or otherwise, I don't know, decided that they must limit the use of the little bit that was left. And so they banned whisky. The making of whisky from barley was absolutely banned. Not for a terribly long time, but for a bit. And so Neil wrote this fine tune. <clears throat> and somebody, I don't know whom, wrote a little poem, verses, to be sung to the tune. The first verse goes like this. You've surely heard of the famous Neil, the man that played the fiddle wheel. I wot he was a canty chill and dearly loved the whisky. Oh, out with the whisky, oh. And I, since he wore tart and hose, he dearly looed the athol bros. And way was he, you may suppose, to bid farewell to whisky o. Oh. Well, here's his tune. <laughs> As I said, the prohibition didn't last all that long. And um, when it was ended and when whiskey became available again, Neil wrote this tune, Whiskey, Welcome Back Again. For some reason in Nathaniel's book, I, I mean, this is a trivial point, the word whiskey is spelled the Irish way, E-Y. Um, so I don't know, I don't know the, the reason for that. But anyway, hardly worth mentioning. Here we go, Whiskey, Welcome Back Again. <laughs>
Nathaniel, who compiled the book of these tunes, did not ask for the second half to be played twice, but it's such a short tune that I th thought I'd do it anyway. And that brings to an end this second video about the Gows and their music.